Okay, this next chapter is about a sampling design. So how do we gather data? Uh, one way is through surveys, okay, handing out a list of questions to people. Another is through opinion polls. Uh, politics does that a lot. Uh, interviews, we could interview somebody and that's gathering data. Uh, we could do a study and studies could be observational and just observing what's happening. Could be retrospective. Um, they could be looking at what's happened in the past or they could be uh, prospective looking at uh, or predicting what's gonna happen in the future. And then lastly, we could do experiments. We're gonna talk a lot uh, this chapter about what's the difference between a study and, and a good quality experiment. So refresh your uh, memory on some definitions. Again, population is the entire group of individuals we want to know information about. Of course, we would love to sample everybody Ask everybody, uh, typically that's not feasible. So what we do instead is we take a sample, we take a small subset, hopefully representative of that population, collect data from the sample in order to make an inference regarding the population. And that is um, the science of statistics. Uh, so more definitions, a census. Okay, a census is a complete count of the population. Now, government tries to do this every 10 years or does do this every 10 years. But why would we not use a census all the time? Well, it's not accurate. Um, how, how are we going to know for sure if we're getting information from every single person in the US or in the country? It also takes a very long time to compile the data. Um, the US only does it every 10 years. Um, so who's to say by the time you've interpreted that data, well, it could be from 10 years ago. Um, it's very expensive, okay? You have to think about mailing something out to every single person. You have to think about paying the statisticians in order to uh, collect the data, analyze the data. And perhaps it's impossible, okay? Do we really think we're gonna get information on every single person in the US? Probably not. And even more difficult is what if we're wanting to do it with animals? If we want to find the average weight of the white-tailed deer population, well, how are you gonna run around and find all those deer? Um, it's gonna be impossible. And if we're using destructive sampling, uh, you could destroy the population. So examples of this um, would be a breaking strength of soda bottles. Okay, anytime you're breaking something, you're destroying the population. So how do we know that we're gonna be able to count it all? Uh, if we're looking at a flashlight flatteries. And more importantly, um, car ratings, you know, they have to crash a car in order to figure out safety readings. Um, and that gets uh, very, very expensive. Sampling design refers to the method used to choose the sample from the population. Sampling design is the method used to choose the sample. And we have several options when it comes to a sampling design. The first one is going to be called a voluntary response. Okay, a voluntary, think about a volunteer, it means when people choose to respond. An example uh, would be surveys and magazines that ask readers to mail in the survey. Um, other examples would be all of your uh, call-in shows, American Idol and whatnot, okay? Yeah, they're saying, hey, call and vote, and you're choosing to either pick up that phone and call and vote. So respondents select themselves to participate in the survey. Uh, that is a voluntary response. Uh, usually only people with very strong opinions respond. Um, this is one of the disadvantages of voluntary response. So normally, uh, think about it, oh, if I only really want this person to win American Idol, am I gonna call in? Uh, if you think about mail surveys, um, maybe if you didn't like the magazine, uh, you're more likely to fill out uh, that survey saying whether you liked it or not, okay? Not always um, if you like. So remember the way to determine voluntary response is self-selection, okay? Think of the word volunteer, you're choosing. Another sampling method is called the convenience sampling. And convenience, think about a convenience store. A convenience store is, uh, it's, it's easy, right? So a convenience sample is when you ask people who are easy to, easy to ask. Uh, this example would be stopping only friendly looking people in the mall to survey. 
Another example uh, would be the surveys left on tables at restaurants. Okay, it's easy just to leave a survey there. Um, it's easy just to leave a survey there. Um, it doesn't mean you're, you, you could be getting data from everybody. Okay, another way is convenient sample could be just to uh, be standing at the front of a store and asking the first 20 people that walk in. Okay, that's very easy to do. A uh, problem with convenience, while it's very easy to do, it produces uh, bias results. Okay, if I'm only asking friendly looking people in the mall, am I really going to be getting um, data from everybody? Okay, if I'm asking about their mall experience, well, if I'm only asking friendly people, well, I'm probably not going to be getting data from the people that are unfriendly because they're the ones that are probably having an issue. Um, the data obtained be considered biased. However, this method is often used for surveys and results reported in newspapers and magazines. Okay, so anytime you read a magazine, there's always that little insert that you can tear out um, and get feedback based on what you liked or didn't like regarding the magazine. And that, and that is an example of convenient sampling. Another uh, type of sampling is your simple random sample, your SRS. It consists of n individuals from the population chosen in such a way where every individual has an equal chance of being selected. And a perfect example of that would be putting everybody's name in a hat and drawing out 10 names, okay? As long as every person possible of getting picked is in that hat, everybody's name is in there once, each student has the same chance to be selected. And it's also where every set of N individuals has an equal chance of being selected. Okay, so if you weren't just choosing one name out of a hat, if you were choosing pairs, each of those pairs would have the same equal chance. And this oftentimes in statistics is the kind of sample that we want to, the majority of the time um, where everybody has an equal chance. So drawing out of a hat uh, could be also uh, using a random number generator. Uh, to pick things. Not only does each student have the same chance to be selected, but every possible group of 10 students has the same chance to be selected. Therefore, it has to be, therefore, it has to be possible for all 10 students uh, to be seniors in order for it to be an SRS, okay? So the simple random sample is just that everybody has equal chance of being selected. No favoritism. So how do we choose an SRS? Um, one way is by using what's called a table of random digits. Okay. And a table of random digits is a long string of digits from zero to nine uh, with the given properties. Each entry in the table is equally likely to be any of the 10 digits. The entries are independent of each other. That is knowledge of one part of the table gives no information about any other part. So how do we choose an SRS uh, from an random digit table, and I will show you an example on the next slide. We're first gonna label our population. We're gonna give it a number. And then we're gonna read the table left to right um, and choose our sample accordingly. So uh, let's show you an example of how we can use a, a random digit table. So here, uh, we have a list of hotels and we are going to choose a simple random sample of four hotels using a random digit table. Okay. Uh, so first thing we're gonna do is we are going to give each of our hotels a number. We're gonna label, okay? So we start with uh, one all the way to 28. Um, you could also start with zero, zero if you wanted. You could do zero to 27 if you wanted to do. Um, it, it's up to you. Uh, so we're gonna, uh, we're gonna number the hotels and this is representative of a random digit uh, line, okay? So what we're gonna do is since our population of hotels, we're choosing four hotels from 28. 28 is a two digit number, okay? So I need to group the numbers in the random digit table by two digits, okay? Why am I choosing two digits? I'm choosing two digits because my maximum number that I labeled for the hotel is a two digit number, okay? So if we go through and group numbers by two digits, that means I have uh, the first two digits, 69, five, 16, so forth. So I'm just grouping it by twos. 
because I have a possible option of up to the number 28. So then I'm going to do is start on the left and say, well, my first number, 69, do I have a hotel labeled 69? No, I do not. So I'm just going to cross that one off and I'm going to go to the next number. What about five? Do I have a hotel labeled five? Yes, I do. That is my first uh, random sample. Uh, five hotel name is called Beach Castle. So I've got my one out of four. So let's go to the next number, 16. Do I have a hotel labeled 16? Yes, I do. That is the Radisson. So Radisson is my second choice in my sample. Uh, 48, I don't have up to 48, so I'm just gonna cross it off. 17, yes, I have uh, a hotel labeled 17, that is Ramada. So I have three out of four, 87. I don't have eight, one labeled 87, cross it off. Uh-oh, 17, can I choose a hotel twice? No, so I'm gonna cross it off because I, uh, I'm gonna cross 17 off because um, I've already chosen that one. And notice 40 I don't have, 95 I don't have, 17 is another repeat, cross it off. I keep going all the way till 20. And do we have a hotel labeled 20? Yes, we do, C Club. So if I choose a random sample of four hotels from a random digit, I keep going until I get my fourth hotel. So those four hotels from my random digit table would be Beach Castle, Radisson, Ramada, and C Club. Okay, always make sure to relate back to what you're talking about. Don't just put the numbers, okay? The numbers don't mean anything in regards to the data. These numbers are representing hotels. So make sure to list the four hotels. Okay, so that shows you how to choose a random sample uh, based on a random digit table. And again, how do you know what to count by? You have to count by whatever your largest uh, digit is. We have 28 hotels, so we're gonna count by two digits. So advantages of a simple random sample. Um, it is unbiased, okay? It is random, it is purely random, it is unbiased. Um, it, it's fairly easy to do if you know your population. Disadvantage is, is that it has a very large variance, so it's very spread out. Um, it may not be representative. Um, you know, let's say randomly you get one of the outliers. Um, it may not be representative of the population. Um, and you have to know your sampling frame. So you have to know your entire population, okay? Because you're numbering your population. Um, so if you don't have your whole population, um, you're not gonna be able to have everybody have an equal chance of being chosen, so it wouldn't be purely random. Another sampling method is stratified. So stratified sample is when we take a population and then we divide it into homogeneous groups called strata. Okay, so we, we divide them based on some same characteristic. Okay, notice the visual up here um, is grouping. We have uh, men in pants together, right? We have women grouped together, and then we have our people in shorts together, okay? So stratified is when we group them um, by a common characteristic. Um, it could be gender, it could be socioeconomic level, it could be uh, religion. Um, so stratified is when you divide into a homogeneous, the same group. So homogeneous, again, means that they are alike based on some characteristic. So after you separate, based on that common characteristic, then you're gonna do a simple random sample from each strata. So if I'm grouping by male, female, I will then separate male, female from my female group. I will then um, label each one, maybe draw out of a hat in order to choose my sample. Uh, so suppose we were to take a stratified random sample of 100 students. Since students are already divided by grade level, uh, grade level can be our strata. So, uh, divide by gr grade level, then randomly select 20 seniors and randomly select 20 juniors, or you could say select 20 from each grade level. Okay, so stratified is grouping by a common characteristic. The advantages of a stratified, um, it's more precise and unbiased than an SRS. Okay, because what if we think that there's differences between male, female, it might be better for us to separate and get an equal number of male responses an equal number of female. Um, and with stratified, you normally only separate based on the strata if you think that there might be variability amongst um, those groups. Um, another advantage is that you have less variability again because you're separating them out based on a common characteristic, I mean, you shouldn't be getting as 
greater spread of data. Uh, the cost is reduced if strata already exist. Again, if we're talking about like finding information out about a school, um, you know, grade level is easy already defined in a school. A, dis a disadvantage is that it is difficult to do uh, if you must divide the stratum, okay, if they're not already put into easy groups. Um, and, and when you get into more complicated statistics, uh, the formulas get very, very complicated. Again, for our intents and purposes, we, we don't have to deal with any formulas regarding that. Um, you just need to know uh, what a stratified sample is. It is dividing it into homogeneous groups or based on a common characteristic. And uh, that it provides a less variability of data at the important AP question. Um, and it will ask for advantages and disadvantages. Also, a stratified disadvantage is that you need the sampling frame. Okay, you need the entire population. If you don't know about everybody, how are we going to split them? Um, if we don't know about them, so that's it. Another disadvantage. So a cluster sample. Okay, well, another type of sample is a cluster sample, and a cluster sample is when we group based on location. Okay, uh, so maybe we are picking only the first row. Maybe we are only picking um, a certain column. Okay, a cluster is based on location. So maybe we're sampling five from each um, from each city. Okay, so cluster is based on location. Uh, and with a cluster, you randomly pick a location and you sample all there. Okay, so let's say if I'm randomly picking a city, I'm going to I'm going to ask everybody in that city the question. So suppose we want to do a cluster sample of SST students. One way to do this would be to randomly select 10 classrooms uh, during second period. And you would sample all students in those rooms. So if you're choosing an exact classroom, that's gonna be based on location, okay? Uh, but the difference between a cluster and a stratified also is that a cluster after you choose that location you're sampling all in that area a stratified you're, you're splitting based on characteristic and then you're doing a simple random sample so you're not you're not sampling everybody okay but cluster location cluster location the advantages of a cluster is that it could be unbiased um cost is reduced you know everybody's in the same area if i go around an apartment building and ask everybody in the apartment building that's not hard to do i'm trying to find out information about um, a whole state, it's going to cost more money. A uh, sampling frame may not be available, um, but I don't need to know everybody in the population. Uh, disadvantages is the clusters may not be representative of the population, okay? If I'm only going to a certain area, let's say if we're, we're talking about cities or only a certain part of the city, um, well, if you're talking about location in regards to cities, there's definitely clusters based on socioeconomic, um, you know, or based on money or based on culture. So if you're only asking people in a certain area, well, um, geography wise, uh, uh, people tend to cluster. So you may be finding that, oh, everybody here is lower income. Oh, everybody here is higher income um, or everybody here is a certain religion. So you may not be getting a good representative sample of of the entire population you want to know about because there, there might be a common characteristic that you don't know about. Um, and again, you don't need to worry too much about this, but formulas are more complicated. Um, we're not going to deal with formulas regarding samples, just what kind of sample it is, advantages and disadvantages. So that is cluster based on location. Uh, unbiased cost is reduced, uh, but disadvantages, it may not be representative of the population. So let's some practice identify the different sampling designs. Um, we have educational testing service, needed a sample of colleges. BTS first divided all colleges into groups of similar types, small uh, public, small private, et cetera. And then they randomly select three colleges from each group. So which of our sampling designs is that going to be? Again, we've talked about convenience, SRS, cluster, stratified, voluntary response. Well, if they're grouping based on similar type, okay, that's going to be a grouping by a common characteristic. So that's going to be a stratified random sample. 
definitely if you're going to um, a private college, they may not have the same demographics characteristics as a public college. Uh, what about this example? A county commissioner wants to survey people in their district to determine their opinions on a particular law up for adoption. She decides to randomly select blocks in her district and then survey all who live on these blocks. So they're choosing based on a block, which is based on location. So location is going to give, be a cluster sample. And again, because it's cluster, you have to survey everybody in that block. So here we have a school assembly. So describe how would you would use the following sampling methods to select 80 students from the assembly. Well, if we're doing a simple random sample, okay, simple random sample, easiest way is if I have how many seats, I have up to 800 seats, I, I put one through 800, all numbers into a hat, and then I can draw randomly 80 out, okay? If everybody's seat number is in there once, I will be choosing 80 students, okay? So that's one way to do a simple random sample. Put all numbers in a hat and draw 80. If I'm gonna do a stratified, stratified is based on a common characteristic. Well, if we're talking about a school assembly, notice here, okay, certain seats are divided up by grade. Okay, so if I wanna do a stratified, well, why don't I separate based on grade? So if I need 80 students selected and I have four grades, how about I choose 20 from each grade? So how about I put uh, numbers one through 20 in a hat and choose 20 12th graders? Why don't I put 201 through 400 in a hat and choose 20 11th graders? Okay, what if I put for only numbers 401 through 600 and choose 20 10th graders. So choosing 20 students from each grade would be an example of a stratified. So cluster, what are we gonna do regarding cluster? Again, cluster is based on location. And cluster, again, you don't want them necessarily to have a common characteristic or you're not purposefully um, collecting data to, based on the common characteristic. So if I wanted to do a sample by cluster, um, I could choose four from each column, because notice I have 20 columns. I could choose four from each row. Uh, you could do that as well. But that's an example of how we could get a sample based on cluster. So inferencing for sampling, the purpose of a sample is to give us information about a larger population. Uh, the process of drawing conclusions about a population on the basis of a sample is called an inference. And why should we rely on random sampling? Well, we need to use random sampling in order to eliminate bias. Okay, if something is truly random, that means that it's not swaying our opinion, the data is not being swayed in any particular way other than just by chance. So main reason is to eliminate bias. The laws of probability allow trustworthy inference about the population. And results from random samples always come with a margin of error that sets bounds on the size. It's always better uh, to have larger samples. Um, larger samples will always give us better information because if I, the larger my sample is, let's say by random, there's one maybe possible outlier in there, um, it's not gonna be affected as much. Um, if I only have 10 data points, well that, and there's a possible outlier in there, well that, that's gonna be great, more greatly skewing the data than if I have a sample of 100 with one possible outlier. Um, so it's always better if possible uh, to get a larger sample um, because there always is room for error. Um, and, and we'll find out later in later chapters, um, we can only ever be 99% confident. We can never be 100% um, because there's always a chance of error. But we wanna make sure that that error is only by chance and not something um, that we can control. Uh, so here's a hopefully a funny little comic. Filling out a reader survey for Chewing Magazine. They asked how much money I spend on gum each week, so I wrote 500. For my age, I put 43. And when they asked what my favorite color is, I wrote garlic curry, or flavor garlic curry. This magazine should have some amusing ads. I love messing with data. 
So this is why we say that there, there, there's always going to be error in data, because especially if you're asking people, how do we know if they're telling the truth or not? So um, there's always going to be some source of error. Our goal is to try to reduce that error as much as possible. And uh, choosing the proper sampling technique um, based on this scenario can help reduce that error. So what can we go wrong? Um, we have four different types of error that could go wrong uh, when we are collecting our data through samples. Uh, so first is bias. Bias is a systematic error in measuring the estimate, okay? That means it favors certain outcomes. This is what we want to try to eliminate as much as possible. We can control, try to control, um, and ensure that we have as little bias as possible when we collect our data. Okay, so bias definition, write it on a flashcard. It's a systematic error in measuring the estimate. And anything that causes the data to be wrong is considered bias, okay? It could be the researcher, me asking the question. It could be the person responding. Um, or again, it could be that you're choosing a wrong sampling method. So sources of bias. Uh, sources of bias are things that can cause bias in your sample. So anything that can cause bias in your sample. And you cannot do anything with bad data, okay? So if you think that your sampling method is wrong or that uh, people are being swayed in a certain way, well, maybe you should choose a different sampling method and collect uh, more accurate data. Um, because if your sample is not representative of the population, um, you, you can't really make an inference um, regarding the population. So under coverage is the first type of bias. Under coverage is when some groups of the population are left out of the sampling process. Okay, they're not even given an oppor opportunity uh, to give their voice. So suppose you take a sample uh, by randomly selecting names from the phone book. Again, some groups will not have the opportunity of being selected, especially these days. Um, Again, oftentimes um, it's only people with landline phones that are in the phone book. Um, these days people can choose not to be in the phone book. Um, if you think about low income people may not have a phone. Homeless people aren't gonna have a phone number in the phone book. Um, and again, some, some higher socioeconomic people don't want their number listed anywhere. Um, so you're excluding a very large number of people. So under coverage is when groups are left out, they're not even given the option uh, to respond or, or be in your sample. And again, this could be people with unlisted phone numbers, usually high income, people without phone numbers, uh, usually low income. And again, if you're talking about phone book, what if people have cell phones? Non-response is another type of bias. Non-response occurs when an individual chosen for the sample can't be contacted or they refuse to cooperate. So they're not responding. Uh, telephone surveys have 70% non-response, okay? So think about those are those telemarketers calling you and if you're choosing not to answer the phone, you're an example of non-response. They're, they're calling you, they're wanting you to be part of the survey, um, but you're choosing not to answer. Or maybe you do answer and you say, no, you don't want to give your answers. Um, so telemarketers are a perfect example. They get a very high number of non-response. Um, obviously, it still works to their advantage. Uh, non-response also are when people are chosen by the researchers but refuse to participate. Okay? So again, the researcher is telling you it's not like under coverage. Under coverage, you're not even calling the person. Okay? You don't even have a chance for the person to be called. Non-response is no, I'm calling you and you're either just not picking up or you're choosing not to respond. Okay? So it is not self-selected. Um, and again, that is often confused with voluntary response. And because of huge telemarketing efforts in the past few years, uh, telephone surveys have a major problem with non-response, um, but they keep calling anyways. And one way to help with non-response is to make a follow contact with the people you are not at home when you first contact them. 
Okay, um, but again, non-response, difference of non-response from under coverage, non-response is they are trying to call you, they have your number, they're calling you, you're either just not picking up or not responding. Under coverage is they don't even know you exist in order to go ask you, okay? Another type of response is response bias. Okay, response bias occurs when the behavior of the respondent or interviewer causes bias in the sample. Okay, this could be through uh, wrong answers. Okay, it occurs when the behavior of the respondent causes bias in the sample. And what it does is it produces wrong answers. So suppose we wanted to survey high school students on drug abuse and we used a uniformed police officer to interview each student. Do you really think they're gonna be honest to a uniformed police officer when asked, did they do drugs? Probably not, right? Okay, they're probably gonna say, oh no, no, I didn't do anything. Um, think about if you were, they were to ask their friend, if their friend asked them if they did drugs, okay, they'd probably be honest, right? Okay, but uniformed police officer, probably automatically you're not gonna get an honest answer. So response bias occurs when for some reason, it could be the interviewer or the respondent's fault, you get incorrect answers. Okay, so response bias is when you get incorrect answers, either based on the way a person is asking a question, um, the relationship of the person asking the question, or whatnot. Same thing with it, if, a, if, if a parent asks the child uh, if they did drugs. Okay, again, they'd probably not be honest, but again, their friend, they'd tell their friend probably the truth. A wording of the question is another type of bias. Uh, wording can influence the answers that are given. And it could be the connotation of words. Okay, am I using big words? Am I using small words that people don't know? Um, as I just said, big words are technical words. Maybe they don't under, you're using a word that people don't understand and so they're answering incorrectly because they, they think the definition is something else. And wording can influence the answers that are given. Um, we just said, so questions must be worded as neutral as possible to avoid influencing the response. Okay, don't be using double negatives. Don't be trying to sway somebody to give a certain answer. The level of vocabulary is very important. Okay, if we're going, if we're surveying in Podunk, Texas, well, maybe we should not use very big words. Okay, keep it simple. Um, if you're gonna go survey doctors, lawyers, um, you can probably use more technical wording because they, they know uh, they probably have a higher vocabulary or at least technical vocabulary. Okay, so wording the question is very important. People can't respond appropriately if they, they don't understand the question. So let's look at this example. Uh, before the presidential election, 1936, uh, the magazine Literary Digest predicting Landon winning the election in a 3-2 victory. A survey of 2.8 million people, George Gallup surveyed only 50,000 people and predicted that Roosevelt would win. The Digest survey came from magazine subscribers, car owners, telephone directories, etc. Okay, so they're putting a survey into a magazine subscriber that, that people have to subscribe to. Okay, so what source of bias is gonna be here if, if your survey is only in a magazine that people have to subscribe to? Well, it's gonna be under coverage. Um, you're only gonna get people that have that magazine. And if they subscribe to a magazine, that costs money. So you're probably getting people from higher income families. Um, you could say that those typically are more Republican um, and so forth. So, um, and you're, you're not allowing every single person to respond, so you can't be sure of the results are gonna reflect the actual election. So under coverage, only people uh, with the magazine are gonna be able to participate. Suppose you want to estimate the total amount of money spent by students on textbooks each semester at a college, and you're doing this by getting receipts for students as long as they leave the bookstore during lunch one day, as they leave the bookstore during one day. Okay, so, we're getting data about the cost of textbooks by collecting receipts at the bookstore as they leave. So is there, is there a source of bias in this scenario? Well, of course, 
um, you're doing a convenience sample. Um, this is easy to collect. It's easy to stand at the register and collect receipts. But are you, do you think you're actually getting an accurate estimate of the cost of textbooks? No, because these days there's all sorts of places you could get textbooks. And as a teacher, I will tell you, um, don't get them from the bookstore because you can find them cheaper online. Um, so you have under coverage because students who buy books not at the bookstore, you're not getting their data. Um, if they're buying online, it's probably cheaper. Um, they could buy used online and it's cheaper. Um, so you're gonna have under coverage there. Okay, you're only getting information um, from people buying at the bookstore, not from not data from people buying elsewhere. And a word of advice, those of y'all getting to go to college soon, uh, order your textbooks online. They will be much, much cheaper than the bookstore. So to find the average value of a home in Plano, uh, one averages the price of homes that are listed for sale with a realtor. So is there any source of bias in this scenario? There's under coverage. Um, if you're only looking at homes in one area that are listed with a realtor, well, then you're leaving at homes that are not for sale or homes that are listed with different realtors. Um, definitely some realtors may only deal with a higher market area, so you're not including those. Um, and also, again, if you know anything about the housing market, um, it fluctuates just based on the economy, right? A house could be worth a lot more a couple months from now. So if you're only including um, the listing prices at that current time, it may not be representative um, overall because maybe it could be a high time and houses are more expensive during that time or it could be that houses are cheaper, uh, are selling cheaper at that time. So um, economy, economics um, is a big factor in housing prices. So again, under coverage, again, you're only talking about one realtor and only the homes that are listed for sale. And that completes our uh, sampling methods. Again, make flashcards of each of those definitions. Um, it is essential that you um, know the different sampling methods, how to collect those different sampling methods, and again, uh, how to describe different sources of bias.